The Housing Assistance Council is a national nonprofit that supports affordable housing efforts throughout rural America. Since 1971, HAC has provided below market financing for affordable housing and community development, technical assistance and training, research and information, and policy formulation to enable solutions for rural communities. Today's webinar is the third in the Build Smart series designed to share innovative solutions for affordable housing developers dealing with escalating prices and implementing additional regulations. Building Smart and Building Healthy will share innovations in building and repairing healthy homes and their impact and correlation to the inhabitants and their communities, while also addressing costs. Presenters will discuss various partnerships and resources, including a large rural health provider system and a public school system, and will continue with building materials, radon, venting and testing, building envelopes that are built tight and ventilated right, minimizing noise, air infiltration, and many other components of home construction. Presenters will showcase impacts from implementation of these collaborations and practices. Thank you to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's Rural Capacity Building Program for sponsoring today's event. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Up first is Andy Kegley. He has served as Executive Director of Helping Overcome Poverty's Existence, Inc. in Wyceville, Virginia, since its merger with Mountain Shelter in 2007. Prior to that, he was the founding board chair in 1991 and became the executive director of Mount Shelter in 1995. He served as chairman of the Wythe County Board of Supervisors in 92 and was a news editor in the Wytheville Enterprise from 1993 to 1994. Kegley completed the Achieving Excellence Program at Kennedy School of Government at Harvard in 2007 and served as chairman of the board of FAHI from 2012 to 2016 and on the board of the Virginia United Land Trust, Virginia Housing Alliance, and the new the New River Land Trust and the Wythe County Public Schools Foundation for Excellence. In 2018, he led the opening of Hope's Social Enterprise and the Open Door Cafe, a donate what you can restaurant. He was a recipient of the VHA 7th Annual Virginia S. Peters Award in 2010 and a Paul Harris recipient from the Wytheville Rotary Club. Dr. Paula Masters is Ballad Health's Vice President of Health Programs, serving in Ballad, Ballad Health's newly created office of Population Health. She oversees the implementation of health improvement programming throughout the Ballot Health Service area. Prior to Ballot, Dr. Masters was with East Tennessee State University, where she served as Assistant Dean of Student Services at the College of Public Health and Director of the Tennessee Public Health Training Center. She was also co-founder of the Center for Rural and Appalachia Health. Dr. Masters has extensive experience in community mobilization, organizational engagement, and health promotion and health improvement. She spent several years working for governmental public health in the beginning of her career. Paula has a doctorate degree in community and behavioral health from East Tennessee State University. She also received a bachelor's degree in health services administration, a master's degree in health services management and policy and healthcare management certificate from East Tennessee State. Rebecca Dillow became the director of strategy and development for Clinch Powell Resource Conservation and Development Council in 2001. Located in Rutledge, Tennessee, after previously serving as the executive director of Appalachian Community Action and Development Agency in Gate City, Virginia. She also has prior experience as a health educate extension agent with Clemson University, South Carolina, and adjunct instructor and adult and adult career coach with Thomas Nelson Community College in Hampton, Virginia. Rebecca received her BA degree in business administration from Franklin University and studied anthropology at Ohio University. Sean Rose is the Director of Residential Development for the Housing Assistance Corporation, a private nonprofit committed to providing safe, affordable housing for low-income persons living in Henderson, Polk, and Transylvania counties within North Carolina. The organization provides a variety of services, including homeowner repairs, home buyer education, homeowner count, homeownership counseling, rental housing, and mutual self-help development program. He also packages applications for USDA RT 504 and 502 loan programs. Sean is the son of a master carpenter and received a crash course in construction while assisting his dad build a home in 2006 that provided us the spark leading to where he is today. After getting married and starting a family, he was introduced to the Mutual Self-Help Housing Program at, at Housing Assistance Corporation and then became a group member to build their own home. Upon completion of the group build, he was hired as a construction supervisor and has since then been involved in the construction of 180 homes. In 2014, he became a licensed contractor and now manages the residential development programs and implements the system vision certification process. 
which teaches the importance of system in a home working together to create a healthy and energy efficient habitats. Through the years, he's embraced many innovations as the theories have evolved, and he looks forward to sharing what he has learned along the way. Welcome speakers. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca, Rebecca, Rebecca Dillo, as was mentioned. I'm with Clinch Powell, RCND. And we are going to, we're excited to share with you today to, about our experience of where healthcare and housing intersect. So I'll go ahead and get, get started. So how did we get here? So uh, a few years ago, there was a merger here in, in rural uh, East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia where we, uh, a new healthcare system came into play and that was Ballot Health. Uh, as leaders, I was at that time, I was working in Southwest Virginia, along with Andy in uh, different agencies, and we were starting to have the conversations and getting feedback from our clients, as well as some of ourselves around some of our um, frustrations and concerns around ballot health and not really knowing, you know, what what to do or, or what they were up to. But we uh, soon heard about around the same time in 2019, we heard about what's called the Accountable Care Community. And the accountable care community is an opportunity for folks from different sectors in the community to come together to talk about the social determinants of health. So as we began attending those meetings, it became very clear that they, the conversation around housing wasn't taking place. There was great conversation. They were talking about, you know, early childhood development as far as, you know, education and literacy, uh, food and things of that nature. But the, the conversation around housing wasn't there. So once we realized that, it wasn't quite a priority for ballot at the time. Uh, we brought that back to the Virginia caucus, initially a FAHI, and we'll get into what, who, what FAHI is in just a little while, but we brought that back to the Virginia caucus. And then we said, let's expand and, and bring in the Tennessee caucus as well, because ballot's footprint covers both Tennessee and Virginia, they're, they're here. So we uh, started getting together and we started talking about how we would approach ballot, who we should approach at ballot. And we got together, we put a proposal together with the leadership and guidance of our, our colleagues at FAHI, and we were able to put together a, um, a really comprehensive proposal to ballot health. And that's when we met Paula, our, our colleague, and she's uh, and that's was her, she was our point of contact with that healthcare system. So we proposed to her and then uh, we kept we kept moving. So I think Andy, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. All right. <clears throat> So thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, one other piece I would throw in there is about the same time as the uh, ballot merger, the Virginia Governor's Housing Conference had a proposal, had a presentation from um, LISC in Eastern Virginia in the Tidewater area where LISC had made a major investment uh, in coordination and cooperation with Centara Health. And that got our attention as a potential model that we could bring back to Southwest Virginia. Admittedly, we have a, a far smaller population and, 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 the, and the localities aren't nearly as, um, shall I say, wealthy as Eastern Virginia. So, um, but we were compelled by that, that model. Um, so as Rebecca also said, you know, this is a project of FAHI. Many of you all around the country probably heard a little bit about FAHI over the years. Um, it's about a 40 year old organization began 1980 initially had the acronym of Federation of Appalachian Housing Enterprises. Um, but it's grown dramatically in the last 20 years under the leadership of Jim King and. Um, um, uh, an expanding staff and expanding network of uh, members. A member is a uh, community Development Corporation, a CHODO, a Housing Authority, a Community Action Program, all the above, some of the above, all kinds of combinations. And there are a little bit under 60 members across now six states, primarily based in Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee, but expanded recently into Alabama. And also there's a member in Maryland. Um, the, the, the power of FAHI is the network, the strength in numbers coming together both as a whole membership twice a year, but also as a caucus, as Rebecca referred to, 
where the different states get together just within their own state boundaries and share ideas. Um, it's a really powerful uh, organization and I've been really uh, blessed to be a part of it. I'm currently on the board and uh, it's, it's a board that represented both the caucus, caucus members as well as um, outside at large members. You can read more about FAHI if you'd like to check on this link here about who is FAHI and, and, and hear more about some of the work going on. FAHI is taking leadership right now in the Partners for Rural Transformation, a nationwide uh, effort to work in uh, impoverished communities, not just in central Appalachia, but the Delta, the Colonius region, the Indian reservations, and um, uh, getting the attention of uh, uh, people in Congress to make investments in these in, uh, impoverished areas. Segway just a second here into my work with HOPE in Southwest Virginia. We're in Withville, Virginia, which is the intersection of uh, Interstate 81 and 77. Many people travel through here and get gas at one of our truck stops. Um, we're in between the New River Valley of Blacksburg, Radford, and Roanoke, and then to the west is Abington, Bristol, metropolitan area. We've got six localities, uh, 120,000 people. Over our 30 years of work, we've done approximately 60 single family homes. We've developed two subdivisions uh, using hack funds, home funds from the state, um, some low income housing tax credit stuff. We've done two low income tax credit, credit projects um, and then have partnered with the Withville Housing Authority on a couple others as well. We developed a little bit of a niche housing with our local community services board that does housing for um, people in, in uh, individuals, developmental and disabilities. Um, we're doing a bookkeeping program for 12 different nonprofits in our community, which is a lifting all boats kind of a project that uh, is all about capacity building. Since, since the pandemic, we've ramped up both our budget and the number of households served. Uh, this was FY19. We did 380 households in just one program from the state of Virginia, the rent and mortgage relief. In the past year, FY21, ending last June, we did over 1,600 homes. We assisted with homelessness prevention and um, rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. We're also pretty heavily invested in food security. We've been doing a school backpack program for six or seven years, about 800 to 900 students each week packing each Wednesday, delivering the bags to schools and the students every Friday. And as, Rebecca and as, also, as the uh, introduction also said, we uh, opened in 2018 our Open Door Cafe, a social enterprise, donate what you can project that um, is serving anywhere from 90 to 110 lunches a day. Many of those, most of those, in fact, paid forward by others. It's a really powerful project right next door to our office. So we have lots of synergies back and forth on um, housing and food as well as other referrals. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to Rebecca, I guess. Mute. Sorry about that, I was muted. Just a small <laughs> correction. I've been with Clinch Pal since 2021, not 2001, just, to, just so everyone's clear. But it's an honor to work with Clinch Pal. We have a long history in East Tennessee. Uh, we've been here uh, in existence for 32 years. This is our 33rd year this year. And we've done a lot of work in, in these categories of development. Uh, we've got over 29 Energy Star certified home constructions. We've, got, we've done rehab and resale of homes. We do a lot of single family, single family rentals, most of them majority reserved for low income or very low income families. So we're very, very uh, in tune with affordable housing and making housing affordable. Uh, what we're finding now is there, the housing is limited to find housing. So that's that's something that we're working on now. And over time, we've uh, we become a HUD certified counseling agency. We've helped up more than 2000 families in the last 20 years with pre and post purchase, help them with rental, high cost mortgages, and also foreclosure prevention. Currently, uh, as you'll see in a minute, we're doing some emergency services as well with the, with the pandemic. We're certified as a financial opportunity center through Rural LISC. 
Uh, Andy had mentioned them earlier. That's a great organization that we work closely with. Uh, as a financial opportunity center, we do long-term coaching and financial literacy, workforce development, and also access to income supports because we understand that it's a long-term commitment to help someone overcome poverty and to create wealth for their family. And through home ownership is one of those ways to create wealth. So we are very, uh, very proud of the work we're doing with counseling and coaching. Just had a conversation yesterday with a young woman who came to us at 18 years old, and she's 22 now and getting ready to close on her first mortgage loan. So really excited about the work that, that how impactful that work is. Uh, we're also a high, uh, do a housing finance. We've uh, financed over $5 million in construction uh, as a CHODO, a community housing development organization, in the last 20 years. Also, we have over $5 million in um, housing finance just since 2016 and almost $1 million in home repair loans that we've offered. Uh, emergency housing services, we've helped over a million dollars in mortgage, rent, utility assistance since COVID. Uh, we're currently working with the emergency services grant, helping folks that have evictions, you know, stay in their home. And we also are helping folks that are homeowners with the uh, housing assistance fund. So we've got a lot of got a lot of work that we've been doing, and we're really excited and honored that we'll be able to serve the, uh, the citizens of Northeast Tennessee and across the state of Tennessee all of these years. All right. I think I have, I don't know, it says stop presenting. I don't want to hit stop presenting because I'm concerned it may cut it off. So, <laughs> so, so what the question is, you know, uh, we, obviously we're housing organizations, you know, and we do a lot of other things. Andy that works with, you know, the food in, food insecurities. We work a lot with the financial piece, but the question became like, well, why should a healthcare system care about housing, you know, and why should we as housing developers care about health? Right. And so that was the question that we posed when we met with Paula and we and we shared this with her. And our argument is there is there's a, a direct connection between housing and health. And if a, if a child, let's say, for instance, doesn't live in a healthy home, their health will be impacted by that. And we see that in, you know, communities are made of homes and houses. And uh, we see that in the homeless communities, the health of the homeless communities is very, very poor because they don't have adequate and healthy housing. So we see a direct link and we hope that through this conversation, you all see it as well. So Paula, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for letting me come on and talk a little bit about our health system and really our journey to um, start working with housing and why we feel it's important. But I'm going to start by really just talking about who are we and then how did we really come about. So Ballad Health is um, a not so little health system located in Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia. We have 21 hospitals across that service area. We have over 13,000 team members. We're one of the largest employers in the entire region and in both the state of uh, Tennessee and Commonwealth of Virginia. We do a little bit over $2 billion in annual revenue. We have a this, this is a little bit dated. It says 850 employed providers. We're almost to 1,000 now when you look at how many providers that we have in our medical associates program. And, um, you know, you can see there just some other stats. But what I really want to show is really around our service area. So I realize we have folks on here that are across the entire nation. So just a little bit around where we truly are. So we're saying Southwest Virginia, and Northeast Tennessee. For us, that's our primary service area. So it's 11 counties in Southwest Virginia and 10 counties in Northeast Tennessee. However, we actually have a 29 four state reach when it comes to service provision as a health system. And so this just shows you a little bit about that. So, you know, back to what, you know, Andy and Rebecca were really talking about, why, why should a health system care about housing? Well, I can tell you that the entire existence of Ballad Health actually is why we should care. So we had two, we are the result of two systems who merged together. And the reason that we merged together is that those two systems saw that while they were beating each other up and spending millions of dollars competing with one another, our communities and our citizens here in this area, their health was not improving. So now, no matter how great of access and services we were able to provide, we still were suffering from disparate levels of mortality and morbidity. And so with that, the systems decided to merge together. 
And in a result, really trying to pivot away from become from a traditional healthcare delivery system to becoming a community health improvement organization, knowing that we had to start doing things extremely different. And so much so to where even though that the result of the merger was that we would have uh, the majority of inpatient, we wouldn't have the majority of outpatient services, but to acknowledge that, that we would have that, that we would have that inpatient majority that we wanted to also show that terms of that merger were more than just provision of healthcare services, that it was really around improving population health. And so through that, we have terms to invest over $308 million over the next 10 years in population health improvement efforts and really around how we become a community health improvement organization. But a little bit more detailed of what that really means is really around looking at those things around what makes us healthy. So, you know, when, when you think about traditional healthcare delivery system is that we're only able to affect about 10% of what makes someone healthy. So no matter if it's absolutely world-class healthcare, everybody has access, we have no equity issues. It's still about 10% because then you're looking at those other factors that create unhealthy or healthy. And so when you start thinking about that, there are more things that we can be doing as a healthcare system, as a community health improvement organization to really improve the health of those communities around us. However, when you look at what is spent, it's in healthcare, it's in medical services. And so we wanted to flip that around and start doing things a little differently. Instead of just looking at our community health, our community health needs assessments and looking at our community benefit dollars being able to be invested into population health efforts, what if we started investing money differently? What if we started braiding funding together? What if we really looked at equity and health disparity and look at that intersection of health, education, and economics as our strategy of what we do as a health system? And so that's really where we had our we had our aha moment, right? Is that being able to see that if we do this, then we can also complement that with still being a fantastic healthcare delivery system. And so that's really where we like. We are definitely what I would say we are um, mission driven, data informed is really how we look at ourselves of how we stand up strategy. So. In that, we started to really look at what really are those social determinants of health. We also look at structural determinants of health. That's one of the things that we've been tackling as well, too. So those things around um, intergenerational poverty, systemic racism. But what about that other level? What about that social determinant level? And that's when we started having the conversations through our wonderful accountable care community. And then where it was great to be able to start talking with my now colleagues slash friends in housing is that there's many different social determinants of health. And unfortunately, we have to have a multi-pronged approach to address all of them because where we are situated in Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia, we have extreme food insecurity and housing insecurity. We have extremely low levels of education. We have intergenerational poverty that is that of other countries. And so how do we start to break that apart well, we do it together. We have to get outside ourselves. It has to be very a collective impact model. And that's really what we have tried to stand up through these partnerships, housing being one of those. So uh, just this, this slide just talks a little bit more around that it has to be an all approach. It can't be an either or. So it can't just be being really good at individual intervention. And it can't just be looking midstream at those social needs that we're finding. It has to be at that level of where we're building capacity through our partners around being able to have more housing, have more affordable and quality housing, but then also being able to assess those family needs, those community needs, and being able to match that supply and demand up with one another at the same time as addressing those individual level needs around more of the healthcare delivery side. So this is a this is another moment of truth. And so we have been um, working. We're in our fifth year, actually, of having this um, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services grant. And it's called an Accountable Health Communities Grant, not to be confused with the Accountable Care Community. But this grant was to let's let's test, let's pilot what it would look like to be able 
to when someone's coming into a health system to be able to truly assess more than just their health status. So really looking at comprehensively, what are those health related social risks? And then being able to look at, is there an association between those risks, those level of risk and utilization patterns of the health system, specifically around looking at um, um, emergency department visits. So on this slide, what you can see that is since we started in November of 2018, we have offered almost 300,000 screenings. Now, this just exists in our Southwest Virginia market. And so that is a lot of screenings that we offered. But what's fantastic is we've had uh, about 166,000 answered. And so that allows us a lot of learnings of how we start to look at where programs need to go, where dollars need to go, what partners do we need to work with? And so this helped to really inform a lot of our efforts moving forward. You can see here that we've had over 47,000 identified needs. I'm going to say that twice because that's nuts. Over 47,000 identified needs. These are unmet needs of the population that we are here to try to improve their health. So we've got to do something differently. And that's really around working through partnerships such as this. And so then you can just see some other things. What I want to call out here is that when those that were screened, when you look at what they said, what, what were the highest frequency of needs, food number one and number two housing. Number three, I'll call out transportation because we see that the majority of time, those three are actually very hard to uncouple, that we see them as, uh, as co-issues many times. And so I just want to show you there. And then when you look at that around those ED visits, you can see that a large majority of those with those needs also, we're coming into the health system with two or more ED visits in a year. Um, so, excuse me, in, within six months. And so that starts to, starts to when you think about um, cost, when you start to think about unmet needs, you start to see, again, that interplay of health, education, and economics. So here it just shows a little bit more of what it looks like for those that had those high ED visits versus those that did not. And you can start to see that there's definitely association in those patterns. So what can we do about it? Well, what we can do is provide another layer of support. We can work with our partners differently, and that's what this really shows. So through our community health navigators, we're able to be a, to truly navigate someone to housing. And so instead of just handing them something that says that here's a couple of partners, we not only provide an inventory, but then we're also able to navigate them. This gives them a different layer. This helps to, instead of sending someone off to try to navigate for themselves or try to be activated themselves, this allows them to have a different level of support. And we know that these folks are some of the most vulnerable, some of the most at risk. And so when and we're so thinking when we're about thinking the equity strategy, then this is really how you start to do that and, and do it in a way that is very familiar, very culturally competent, and uh, really something that we have to rely on our community partners to assist us with. So this is just a little bit about what it looks like, our, our patient journey, if you will, is that when, so, uh, when a client comes into our system, we're able to assess their need. And when we find that they have a housing need, we're able to navigate them over. We also most recently are able to support that with an electronic referral system called Unitas. So not only now are we able to wrap them around with a, a community health navigator support, we're also able to send an electronic referral to a number of our partners. So that way they can pick it up. They know that that person is coming. They can go ahead and start looking at eligibility. They can start thinking about how they can meet those needs. And they can see also if that client has other needs that they can also then send on. So it very much allows for us now to have a connected, integrated ecosystem of support that gets outside of healthcare delivery and really stands up an ecosystem of social care, which is a little bit different way to think about how we can improve community health. And so that's just a little bit about what it looks like from the healthcare side. And so now I will turn it back over to my colleague. Yeah, thank you, Paula. Um, and when she, when Paula mentioned the moment of truth with that uh, numbers that we started getting the reports from the uh, CMMS uh, emergency department screenings, that really was an aha epiphany just to see the need out there. 
I've used those numbers in multiple applications and narratives in the last um, couple of years that we've been working with Valid. So it's a really valuable tool, and I'm really happy that that's available to the Virginia in the Virginia footprint of Valid. Um, and so th this collaboration that we're building, and it's truly a structure that's under construction and, and taking on um, uh, exciting possibilities. You know, we worked through FAHI rather than the eight or nine members of FAHI that are in the ballot footprint. We asked FAHI if it would make sense for FAHI to submit a single application to, to ballot in the first offering, which was last March, I believe. Um, and, and and that's that's perfect role for FAHI as an intermediary, as a collaborator, as a convener. Um, we do this kind of thing on housing work, but this was probably one of the first times where it's sort of outside the housing realm and into this healthcare field. Um, put in an application on behalf of, I think it was seven of the eight members that are in the ballot footprint. And, you know, FAHI is able to, they've got a staff, they're able to, uh, administer the funds, they're able to share data, they're able to collect reports from each of us, eight, seven, eight members. Um, they're able to convene the meetings. We've been meeting either electronically um, uh, on a monthly or every other month kind of basis. Uh, we've been meeting and talking about this at the spring and annual uh, spring retreat and the fall meetings. And where we are right now after this first anniversary is working with Paula staff there at Ballot on a second year of this funding that potentially is going to expand and allow us to do a little bit more as we all sort of recognize the the dividends to come from this kind of um, trailblazing experience. And as I said, you know, we're we're excited about where this can take us. You know, we hope we might be able to get the attention of some national, not just regional, but national funders that uh, be it any, anybody from HACK to the Robert Wood Johnson to LISC to others, other uh, potential uh, health insurance companies. My, my agency is working right now on a uh, Anthem Foundation food as medicine project application, and we're leaning a little bit on the information we've leaned from participating with uh, Ballot on this. So um, uh, it's it's been a uh, a learning collaborative, but it's also, I think, something that we're all being able to share to our stakeholders here on the ground in our each of our service areas, some benefits. So back to you, Rebecca. All right, thank you so much, Andy. And I did want to echo uh, something that Paula had uh, touched on about the community health workers. And when I was working over in Southwest Virginia, that was one of the initial contacts. I received a phone call from the emergency department, one of the community health workers that was navigating the employees or the, the clients there. And they were asking about housing and, and asking how um, the services we provided, if they had the correct information. So that was kind of like all of this stuff happening at the same time. But these were the members of the collaborative. Uh, in Tennessee, we have uh, the Appalachia Service Project, Clinch Powell, Eastern 8 is a CDC, uh, and then the Housing Authority in Kingsport, Tennessee. The Virginia members were um, Appalachia Community Action and Development Agency, Bristol Regional Housing Authority, Hope Inc., and People Inc. Those were the initial eight. And since that time, uh, we have seven that are still part of this collaborative and still moving forward. Uh, so some of the activities, you know, we, as you, as you've heard earlier, we're, we're focused on housing, but we do other things as well. But with this support of ballot, ballot and this funding, we've been doing uh, the housing rehab, weatherization for folks that have weatherization programs. We've been providing utility and rent assistance, helping with the food insecurity issues here that we see here in Central Appalachia. Also the financial cap uh, capability counseling, homeless prevention, supportive housing, and rapid rehousing are some of the uh, areas that this funding is helping. I know we're running low on time, Andy. I think I'm going to Rebecca. Did you take control of the? Did you take control of the presentation? because I'm not sure if it's advancing for everyone. No, I did not. I'm sorry. I thought it was moving. It was moving on my end. It was there moving on your end. Yeah. Yes, it was. It's your special <laughs> speaker superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, so here we are, the activity. So what we're learning is that, um, uh, you know, we're, at, we're, at, we're telling the story. So every time when we're doing the reporting to Ballad, we're telling stories of successes with this funding, what's happening. And uh, we're really able to identify those narratives to show that health and housing 
there's a, a strong intersection there. So in those success stories, for instance, we had someone that came to Clinch Pal that had lost their job because of COVID, and we were able to help them with this funding and with the help from Ballot, able to get back on their feet. And they're actually working at Ballot now, which is wonderful. Also uh, in Kingsport Housing, there was a single mother that was housed there, uh, and she was able to complete her nursing degree and is now employed as a nurse. Uh, some other uh, other points that we're learning is that we have, again, the access to Unitas is a data referral system that's going to be very helpful and continues to grow and more people are getting involved with that referral system. Um, there's also health questions on our intake now. As before, we didn't ask as many questions about health on our end, and now we're asking more questions about health so we can refer, cross-refer back over to Ballad with any of the health-related uh, needs that they have. And also, we've, uh, we're learning about the mitigation of negative environmental health impacts in the home, such as radon and uh, mold and other things that we can have an impact on. So we're still exploring that and learning as we go. Okay, these are some of the numbers. This was just from May to July of 21. As you can see here, we've been doing a lot of work. Uh, we have all the different organizations listed here at the top and the total number of households we've served in a very short time was over almost 33,000 households that we've served. So we're really, as you can see, this work is uh, it's growing and we're making a tremendous impact in this area. Okay. Andy, do you want to take it from here or you want me to just wrap it up? Because I know we're... Times. You, you, you can wrap it up, you'd be fine. Okay. Yeah, so so next steps, we're going to continue this work. This is, as Andy mentioned, we've we've gotten, we're looking at the second year of funding uh, that RFP is out, and we were definitely going to apply for that funding. We want to continue this collaborative work and this partnership with Valid. Uh, it's also, we're hoping that this will inform other healthcare systems where you live and that you will take the leadership and take the initiative to reach out to those healthcare systems to even see about the possibility of this happening where you live wherever you are in the, in, in the country. Uh, we, all, we hope to receive that additional funding and other health related funding, and we're gonna to continue to advocate at a state and national level uh, for funding around housing, especially healthy housing and things that we can do to make uh, homes as healthy as possible. And I think with that, we have, uh, you know, we wanna say thank you and we wanna open it up to any questions anyone may have. going to save the questions to the end, please. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so if you will take it from here, Sean. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Rose. I'm with Housing Assistance Corporation in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Uh, we're a local nonprofit uh, that does new construction. We do home repairs. Uh, we've got 350 rental units. Um, so I just want to talk to you today about just some nuts and bolts of um, basically the construction process and the system of a, a house as a whole and kind of how all the systems work together. So uh, the first step to um, to achieving this is, is really just creating a airtight um, envelope. So um, you can see here on the pictures, it shows some some common penetrations that are made throughout the house. Obviously, houses are made of of lots of different components, all of which are joined together, um, sometimes with large gaps that that leak. Uh, Sean, leak. I believe you you also need to take control of the oh, presentation. Right. Whoops. There we go. Thanks. All right, so on this first slide, I think, uh, yeah, uh, you can you can see where um, it just kind of shows some common areas where where air infiltration happens in in a home. Uh, there's many many pieces to a house, uh, creates lots of gaps, and uh, and you really uh, need to focus on air sealing to keep the environment out um, outside out, and uh, you know keep keep the, all the heat inside. Let's see here. I can't see. <clears throat> so um, usually this is achieved by um, you know simple things like caulking, uh, spray foam around windows and doors. Um, if you're building new construction, there's some really good products out now called Zip System, which which creates a super tight envelope. Um, we've had a lot of a lot of luck with that, and. Um, <clears throat> 
I'm sorry, guys. Bear with me. My voice, I, I actually went to the NCAA tournament over the weekend, and I did a little too much yelling. So, um, And uh, in, in our area, it's actually required. I'm not sure nationwide if it's required or not, but a blower door test can verify the tightness of, of a home, and um, that could be done on an existing home, on a, on a new construction house. And uh, I really recommend that if you're building anything new or trying to do any repairs that you you hire a HERS rater. Um, they can come in and do all the verification for you throughout the whole process. Um, so, you know, if, if you think about a house as like a cooler, you know, usually the outer shell is airtight and then um, you go into the installation. All right. So here on this slide, I've just got some uh, some pictures of what not to do. And then the bottom one kind of shows you what it should look like if it's done correctly. Uh, the one on the top left, it shows misalignment. There's huge gaps. And the crazy thing about fiberglass insulation, it's designed to touch all six sides. And if it doesn't do that, you actually lose, um, I believe the number is 60% of the R value for that entire cavity um, with just an eighth of an inch gap on any of those six sides. Um, on the right, you can show, uh, you can see where it's been compressed. Fiberglass insulation is also not supposed to be packed tight. So you can see where they obviously have those pieces too large. They tried to cram it in there. Not only does it compress the insulation, which takes away the R value, but it also creates gaps um, to where it's not touching all six sides. So you've just lost a huge amount of uh of insulating value in that wall right there uh, if you look at the bottom you can see it's nice and fluffy touching all sides uh cut correctly around electrical boxes uh there's actually a small space behind electrical boxes where you need to um leave a little bit of the insulation so that it tucks behind there uh, to get everything to work properly all right next all right, so now we've created this tight envelope and this slide here just shows some common pollutants that are, um, you know, released inside the home. So you've got animal hair and dander, you've got chemicals from cleaning, uh, smells from cooking, moisture from taking showers. All this stuff can create mold, can create health problems, and uh, you really, um, you know, older homes used to breathe kind of more on their own. Newer construction is a lot tighter, so I think that a lot of these things are more amplified now, if not ventilated properly. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to the next one. So one way to, to do this, um, this, this is a product that we use, it's called an HRV, heat recovery ventilator. And it's about the size of a microwave and it can be installed in the crawl space or in a laundry room or in the attic. And basically what this does is it constantly runs and brings fresh air from the outside into the home. And it takes stale air from the home and takes it to the outside. And you can see the little graphic on the right. Um, so you're taking the air from the outside or from the inside of the home to the outside. It goes across the coil. It kind of heats that coil up passively. And then as the air comes in from the outside, it travels across that same coil, not mixing with the air, obviously, but that helps to preheat or pre-cool the air that you're bringing in from the outside. And you want to have about 0.35 air exchanges per hour. Um, like I said, we've created this tight envelope. We want to create controlled um, penetrations. So this is one easy way to do that because you've got you've got you know two vents on the outside. You can you can seal them up tight to the um, OSB and just let it kind of run continuously. It does have a filter and it also uh, removes condensation. So you can actually use these and this kind of helps with the cost of it a little bit. But you can use one of these in place of a bath fan. So if you have a bathroom or a powder room that's centrally located where you would normally have a bath fan. You can actually install the exhaust part of this in that room and uh, it'll be basically like a continuous bath fan. All right. So 
So the ventilate right part, um, you know, we kind of touched on the HRV. If you look at this picture on the left, and, and this is just kind of kind of basic, but um, typically we try to uh, our uh, bathroom fans have to test at 50 CFM for our HERS rater. So this is a system that we go through. Um, it's put on by the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. It's actually called System Vision. Um, so they've got a lot of boxes to check, similar to Energy Star, but they they touch on you know a lot of the HVAC stuff. And if you look at how this bath fan is installed, um, <laughs> they they could have flipped it around to where it's just a straight run. Instead, that air has to go out one direction, change directions, and then get to the outside. So typically on a bath fan, if you're wanting to achieve 50 CFM, you, you have to at least get an 80 CFM because from the manufacturer, those are tested right at the casing where the air comes out. So they're, they're not even taken into account duct work, let alone improperly installed duct work that's longer than it needs to be and has more bends than it needs to have in it. Um, things like these are are also looked at by the HERS rater. Um, we get them out about three times during construction. They look at our insulation. They look at uh, the framing for gaps and air leaks. They look at all the HVAC, all the uh, um, bath fans, the ventilation fans. Um, and uh, I really recommend having a HERS rater. I can't say it enough because we found so many issues throughout the process. Stuff that we paid good money to um, to somebody to install and it's not done properly and bath fans is a big one um, there's lots of things lots of ways we've had you know where the electrician has not pulled the tape off of the flap to where the siding guy has shoved the pipe up into the soffit and it's basically not doing anything on the right there you can see a picture it's just kind of I thought it was kind of humorous um, obviously those ducks are are you know way longer than they need to be and they're all coming out of one location lots of kinks and that creates hot and cold rooms uh, if you've ever been in a home where you know one room is piping hot and the other one's cold it's typically because the airflow is not pressure balanced and a lot of that comes from duct work getting kinked or um, being too long not sized properly all right, on this slide, um, it shows some common areas that, that require air sealing. Um, a lot of contractors will just go out and you'll see them put ductwork together. And, and I, I'm talking more on the new side, but all this can be retrofit into an existing home as well. Um, but they'll come out, they'll put the ductwork together, they'll put some of that metal tape around it and they'll call it a day, cover it with insulation, maybe a zip tie and expect that to be good enough. Well, it's really not. Um, over time, that tape comes loose, creates little holes. That hole might be, you know, in your attic on the return side, which means that all of a sudden it's sucking air from your attic, taking it through the furnace and blowing it into the house. It could be in the crawl space, so then you're getting all that nasty air. Um, also, if you're not sealed properly on the um, supply side, then, I, you know, obviously all this heat that you're paying to create or air to condition um, is is now blowing into cavities where you don't want it. Maybe the crawl, maybe the attic, maybe in the wall. Um, and you can see some, you know, the, if you look at the bottom right down there, uh, the one on the left with the green check box that they painted mastic on. And basically it just comes in a bucket. You take a little paintbrush, anywhere there's a joint in a pipe, you paint it and then it dries hard and it's sealed forever. Um, so that that really helps a lot with the um, <clears throat> air leakage of the ductwork. Uh, the bottom left picture actually is a good example of a penetration that would need to be sealed to create you know, an airtight envelope. So you see where they've got a return or a supply there. I'm not sure which, but it's not installed very well. There's huge gaps around the sheetrock. Um, that happens also around, you know, when they cut out electrical boxes in the ceiling, uh, you can get a lot of leakage there. The top right shows um, <laughs> these people tried hard. Uh, they got the pipe basically on the boot. They put the zip tie on there, um, but then they painted the mastic on the insulation. 
So basically it's doing absolutely nothing. Um, the inner liner where the air actually travels through is leaking, but then they've got the insulation painted to the pipe. So that's that's obviously not going to work. So, you know, security of, of the duct work, make sure it's nice and sealed. Um, a lot of times contractors historically will oversize units, okay? They'll come in and they'll want to sell you a two and a half ton when you might need a one and a half ton. Uh, the reason they do this is because they know that their pipes leak and they don't want to take the time to do the math and to, to make the pipes, you know, tight so that you're getting the full effect of everything that you're creating. So this next slide, this is an example um, on the left there, you've got a disconnected return duct that was probably not sealed or, or secured properly, obviously. So it's now laying in a nasty crawl space, and it just so happens that somebody crawled in there uh, next to it. And uh, anyway, I think I think that uh, that speaks for itself. But this currently is sucking air from this spot and blowing it through the furnace into the house. So. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a, a nasty old crawl space, but I guarantee if you go in one that's an older home, it's probably got some tape hanging off of the duct work and mold and, and water standing. And that's really not good. So here, site drainage, you know, it, it, it takes planning on the front end. Um, anybody who's ever built a house could understand that building it too low is really bad and hard to fix. So you really, uh, you want to look at the site, especially if you're on a smaller site and make sure that you get all the water going away from the house. It'll not only create foundation issues, but it'll, it'll create some nasty spaces underneath the home as well. Uh, water infiltration, mold, mildew, bugs. So here's an example of a crawl space. The one on the left obviously has some water issues. We got some standing water there. You can see where they put plastic down on the ground for a vapor barrier, but it, I mean, you can't really tell me that's doing a whole lot because I think there's more holes than there are plastic. Um, so on the right here, you see a system that's called encapsulated crawl space. We do this on every home. Um, <clears throat> you can see it's got shiny uh, foam board around the wall. So basically, it's a it, it's a thick plastic that's taped at the seams. It's sealed at all uh, locations on the wall, around columns, everything. And you take uh, R10 foam insulation and you put it around the perimeter. And by doing that, you can actually not put insulation in the floor. So you notice these floor joists, there's no fiberglass bats in there because now this has become a semi-conditioned space in the, in the crawl space. And it makes for a very nice, very clean, very well-lit area that, you know, if something does happen and you have to go in there to, to do some maintenance or hit the shutoff valve or whatever, you know, you're not, you're not climbing into the one on the left and, um, and dealing with that. It's also a lot better um, in, in humid clim climates. Uh, you actually seal all the vents off so you don't have that cold and hot air mixing underneath the house. Um, so that, that can create condensation, create mold. Um, so yes, it's a much better system. And you actually, when you do this, you run a small supply from your um, air handler into the crawl space that, that keeps it pressurized with conditioned air. This one here, um, I heard Radon mention earlier, I believe it's one of the leading causes of lung cancer. Um, so on all of our homes, we live in the mountains, we have a lot of rocks underneath us, and uh, decomposing um, rocks is basically what causes the Radon gas. Um, we, we have to test all of ours, and it's actually code in our area, I'm not sure if it is everywhere, but we have to include a passive Radon system. So basically what that is on the picture on the right, you can see it, it creates a big T. So you've got a three or four inch pipe that would go in a two by six wall, starts in the crawl space, goes all the way up through the house and out the roof. And then that T at the bottom has lots of holes drilled in it. And then obviously our thick plastic would go over top of that in the crawl space. And that just creates a, you know, the, uh, what is it? The Venturi effect that, um, 
you know, will will naturally suck the gas out. Plus, uh, the beauty of this is if it ever becomes more of an issue in the future, we put an outlet in the attic. So all they have to do is install one of the fans like you see on the left, the bottom left picture. Um, they cut that pipe, install that inline fan, plug it in, and then it's not a passive system anymore. It's an active system. So this is something that we do in all of our houses. Um, we typically test under the um, under the limits, which I actually um, included on the left over there at the top. Uh, but you know, if if you do test high, then that's when you go in and you do some more mitigation factors, like adding the the fan to it. Let's see. I'm trying to go through this quickly. I know we're short on time. All right. So this one um, actually. <laughs> I found this very interesting. I, I had never really thought about this until I was asked to do this presentation and I did some digging, but cluttered spaces. All right. So they cre it creates higher stress levels. So if you think about it, if you can't find what you're looking for, then you're stressed out. More fatigue. If, you, if you're constantly looking at messes that need to be cleaned up or work that needs to be done, then your, your mind's constantly thinking about that and can't rest. So it creates fatigue. Um, obviously, more surface to collect dust mites and mold. If you've got clutter everywhere, you know, it's it's collecting more mold and dust, uh, it's, which makes it hard to clean surfaces. Um, safety hazards, trips and falls, uh, egress issues. Um, one thing that I know uh, in affordable housing, we don't build huge homes. So if all of a sudden our huge or our small home has nothing but windows on the exterior walls because that's the way it was designed and big open floor plans with no wall space, then you don't even have a place for a dresser or a, a, you know a chest to put things in. So really thinking about this stuff on the design side, um, trying to keep plenty of wall space um, where you can where people can store stuff, plenty of closet space, cabinet space, storage buildings outside, all of that. Um, helps be more healthy. All right, this one I thought was kind of funny. It reminds me of grandma's bathroom, but um, hers was green. Uh, so, you know, easy to clean surfaces. I don't think anybody puts carpet in bathrooms anymore. Thank goodness. But um, the use of solid surface flooring, uh, you know, easy to clean uh, kitchen surfaces um, makes it obviously easier to clean. And so it'll get done more frequently. And then just a quick summary, uh, we have the tight thermal envelope. So we've gone around, we've air sealed all the penetrations, the ventilation with the HRV bath fans and the range hood. Range hood I didn't mention before, but typically we shoot for 100 CFM there. And it goes to the outside, not the recirculating kind that just sucks it in and blows it back out, but actually pipe through the roof or out, out the wall or wherever wherever it is. Uh, keeping the air you paid to condition, um, seal all your pipes with mastic, make sure that everything's tight and jammed up. Uh, changing a quality air filter. Um, some systems are, are designed to have better filters than others. So I don't recommend going out and buying the most expensive one that you can find because it might not work well with your system. Uh, but do get, you know, don't buy the cheapest one either and make sure that you change it frequently. Uh, positive site drainage, you know, slope away from the house. Uh, comfy crawl spaces, that's just um, the encapsulated crawl. If you don't have an encapsulated crawl space, I would encourage you to at least check the vapor barrier, make sure it's not got holes in it and that your vents are working properly. Uh, provide ample storage. Uh, radon gas, we talked about that, and keep it simple to clean. Now, one thing I put at the bottom, potential funding. Um, our state actually, through the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, offers developers um, up to $8,000 um, for participating in the System Vision program. So that helps to offset the cost um, of the upgrades. And I don't think that it's available everywhere. Actually, when I Googled it, it said that we were the only state that does it, um, but it's a really cool incentive. And so you might want to check in your area and see if anything similar to that is available. And then also um, I wrote a note down, please contact a HERS Raider. Um, they're very inexpensive. It costs like $350 tops. 
Uh, they'll come out and they'll check through all stages of construction, make sure that you've got, you know, air sealing is done correctly, your insulation is done right. Basically, everything that you're paying to do already, they will make sure that it's done correctly and working properly. And you would be really surprised if you start to use one, if you don't already, how many problems pop up that are just silly things, um, but make a huge difference. So that's what I've, that's all I have. <laughs> Thanks, Sean, and to all the Valley Health and Bobby group. Um, we've got a very short amount of time for questions, but please stay on. Uh, we're not going to cut you off or anything, but uh, appreciate everyone joining the webinar, and it will be posted after uh, after the webinar. The materials will go out, so um, you'll, you'll get the recording, watch your emails, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, the floor is open to whoever you want to talk to. Um, there was a question about um, can we help with smaller rural hospitals and Paula, this might be to you. Um, uh, how could this system work without the scale of ballot? Like if you were a smaller hospital setting, what would you advise a group to, how do you approach a smaller hospital? That's a great question. And I, I think that the way <laughs> that I would answer it is that even though we're handling it at the system level, is that it could be scaled up or down, just depending upon how how what scale you really wanted to hit it. You know, we started this back up in you know like we're in our fifth year, being able to work differently and assess these folks, and we started in a piece of our market, and now we're able to scale it across all of our entire service area. So I think that you could definitely scale it and just leverage the partnerships that are that are there in your area. Would love to talk to you more about that and learn more and, and think through it with you if you're interested. And so please feel free to just use my contact information and reach out. Thanks, Paula. Um, Sean, uh, how much are the um, HRV units that you're referring to? And then someone also asked, have you looked at using it ductless mini splits? Uh, the HRVs, uh, the HR I believe they're, they, they just recently went up like everything else, but I think they're somewhere around $700. So they're not cheap, but they're, they're really a good solution. Um, and like I say, if you take away, we use pretty high quality bath fans. So if you take that out of one of the bathrooms, you know, there's $250 recouped right there. Um, so it, it makes for a good system. And then what was the second question? Have you looked at using Douglas mini splits? Um, we oh. have not. I know. Um, I, know I know a lot of people do. We we just haven't really gone there yet. Um, do you know if your continuous air exchange runs twenty four seven? Is there a manual shut off on those? There is a manual shut off. It has a switch on the unit, uh, but it does run twenty four seven. So that's the questions out of the chat. If anyone has anything, uh, please just unmute your mic and uh, you can ask a uh, participant. Someone ask, uh, Sean, what was the name of the service for checking systems of insulation called? Okay, that, that would be um, working with a HERS rater, H-E-R-S. Um, they, they come out and they check the insulation. Uh, well, they'll do different scopes, but if you get the full service thing, typically they come out and they'll, they'll do an inspection before you insulate, um, after you insulate. Uh, They'll come back at the end and they'll check the bath fans and the, the range hoods and do the blower door test and um, and check for the tightness. Uh, so and then once everything's operational, um, they, they also come back and pressure balance the system uh, to where they'll go in each of the individual rooms, um, change the dampers to where you've got the right amount of air going to each room so that you don't have the hot cold. Um, but I, I can't say it enough. I mean, they've 
they found so many things and it's kind of embarrassing but i mean it's just silly stuff that that happens along the way that nobody nobody knows is there until they find it um Anyone else with questions? I had a question. Sean, thank you so much um, for sharing the information about the radon mitigation. That's really, uh, it's great to see that you're putting that in, in, in all new builds in North Carolina. So my question is, how much do that, does that system cost? Does it vary or is there a pretty kind of a range for the price for that type of system? For just the radon? Mm -hmm. um, our plumber does it. Um, it's basically the cost of the pipe and whatever small amount he charges for labor or tax it on but it's just included when he comes out and does his rough in he okay. uh he puts that t in the crawl space and then you know takes it up through the roof uh okay. so it go you know it gets installed before the shingles or anything goes on and, and before right. the vapor barriers well we've got a temporary vapor barrier that we put in the crawl space mm -hmm. uh, before the heavy plastic goes in there but, okay, so it's just included in that cost. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 minimal. I don't know that he's actually got a line item for that. It's just kind of worked into his mm -hmm. total price. Awesome, thank you so much. And, I think and I like I said, in those in those fans are are fairly inexpensive. I think we had to purchase one for a house. It's I think they're a couple hundred dollars, and they just plug into an outlet. So if you just put an outlet, you know, up in the attic, which could be handy anyways for somebody, um, and you put it next to that pipe or in that area it, it's super easy to add that fan later if you know once you get the house built you do a radon test if you're kind of creeping up there close to the limits you can add that fan in for a couple hundred dollars awesome. thank you so much there's a posting in the chat about a feedback form and we please encourage everyone to, to please fill out the evaluation form for us so that we know that we're uh, providing information to you that is helpful and relevant. So please urge you to fill out the evaluation form and thank you everyone for participating. We've enjoyed it, learned a lot today and uh, look forward to future webinars. So thank you so much. Goodbye. Thanks.